most people don't do their hobby as their profession. Like, this is my hobby. Yeah. This is my passion. This is what I love to do. I love building businesses. This is fun for me. Like, I'd rather be doing this than playing Fortnite. I'd rather be doing this than skiing. I'd rather yeah. be doing this than rock climbing, yoga, cooking, watching Game of Thrones. This is my hobby. And like, I keep telling everybody in the macro to live their hobby, live their passion, live their happiness. And, uh, and I'm doing it. Yeah. My mom and my dad make a joke that we're working dogs. My parents don't know how to relax. Our default is to work. We like it. It's our hobby. I would, like, I like to work. I'm sorry. I don't want to go skiing. <laughs> I do not want to go on a yoga retreat. I'm not interested in being on Twitch for nine hours unless I'm psychoanalyzing the framework of 14-year-old gamers. I am a aspiring chef. Um, I'm in culinary school right now. Um, I'm trying to make a side hustle sharpening knives. I love this idea. I'm gonna give you a tremendous piece of advice that too many people that are ideological and don't actually play in the game push against, but I believe in it the most. You should go sharpen knives for five restaurants for free. For free, okay. Yep, like, what, like I spoke for free for the first 13, for, for, no, I actually got paid for the first one because that's how it also, for 13 of the first 15 times I ever spoke, I spoke for free, including paying for my flights. It's one thing to do free work, it's another thing to do free work with heavy strategy. When I do free work, I try to think of two things. How much exposure is it? Like Tyler will tell you, sitting right here, one of the only times I still do free work is if it's massive exposure. There are 49,000 people in the audience. I'm like, oh, it's a lot of exposure. You know, like, <laughs> like it's live on, you know, it's during the Super Bowl. Like, like I'll pay somebody to put me in a Super Bowl commercial, right? Like it, when, they, when, yeah. when I get exposure or, and that's where I'm at now, in the, for you, when you pick these five restaurants, let it be the biggest restaurants in your 30 mile radius. Let it be the kindest. Let it be somebody who has the biggest Instagram following and maybe like, whether you, you know, you never wanna give with expectation but it's, it's okay to ask. You're like, hey, I'd love to sharpen your knives for free. Uh, and then like you get in there and the vibes are feeling good. Maybe you're like, hey, listen, like, I hope you enjoyed it. Like, wouldn't mind to take a picture for my Instagram which then makes them say, oh, we'll put you on our Instagram. Like, you can be thoughtful and do it the right way but if nothing else, if you do it for free for five people, you've established that you do it. Word of mouth is a remarkably fascinating thing. Strategic free work is one of the great moves in our society. You were talking about sports cards heavily to the iconic guys. Why do you think that you're able to see those trends come? I don't know. I don't know why certain things become obvious to me. Social media, the internet itself, rappers, you know. <laughs> First of all, I don't predict anything. So, like, there's an article on Forbes.com right now that says sports cards up another 15% as an alternative investment. What I'm good at is actually knowing something's gonna extend. Yeah. Extend. I think people see things that I see I think certain most. I think I'm very good at understanding if something's going to be a fad for a month or a trend for three years. That's what I'm good at. I don't think most people are actually judging themselves either. I think they're taking the voices of others to allow themselves to be judged. People are like Gary, I hear you, but what if you're? You know, they're like, I get it. Don't listen to others. But what if your own voice, the one in your own head, is telling you you suck, shit, or this that, and the other thing? I'm like, you've taken on the voice of someone else. I really believe that. And for some reason, through self-esteem, serendipity, and many other things, very, I mean, I consciously, in third grade, decided to not try in school. Not because I was the normal third grader, because I definitely wasn't. It was because I was like, this has nothing to do with my life. And I'm gonna start working on my actual skill. And I'm willing to deal with the judgment of my teachers. Do you know how not fun it is to grow up your whole life and have your, all your friends' parents think you're a loser? because the only framework in society at that time is your school grades. If you're a national bank, instead of spending $50 million on television commercials that nobody sees, I'd rather go give a big time production company $10 million to be the sponsor of a new show on Netflix called ATM, where the whole show transpires around ATMs and it is literally your company, like actually, not a made up bank. The Ed Sullivan Show was funded and created by the Lincoln Town Car Company. People forget that history. Television started with brands funding it. 
Commercials came later. I believe now that commercials are gonna be disappearing because we're watching streaming. I do, not, I do believe that Netflix and Hulu and Amazon will test commercials. My intuition is if they're smart, they're gonna do product integration. And I think, look, let me give you another one. I've always thought that a, a, like a big car company with like the trucks should do a show called The Tailgate where the whole show, again, is at a tailgate. And it's your truck is the family's truck. Toyota, Ford, and like, that works. Was how, it's interesting because watching the Masters yesterday, how mature the whole brand placement and lack of advertising becomes. It's, it's just, it's amazing what can be done. Or the new world we live in. On Twitter, the number one thing that people were talking about was Tiger chewing gum. <laughs> and so we have a gum client. So I called him, this is Sunday now, you gotta move fast. I'm like, hey, dude, 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 you know, like, you know, like, like there's, mo- like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw at one of the award show, the Fiji water girl, right, the woman. I, I don't I think they call it, you know, like, that, like that's moral weight. Like, guys, nobody watches commercials. Nobody goes through direct mail carefully. Nobody's going to page 37 of a magazine looking at the ad carefully. Like, the world has changed, I'm sorry. Farming used to be our number one industry. Things happen. Like Sears was number one. Walter Cronkite was, you know, America's dad. Like things change. I'm sorry things change. Things have changed. Times when I talk to Caleb or anybody on my team, like, you know, I'm the breakout personality in the business space in this last couple years while actively being a CEO and CEO of a massive company. And when I talk to them, like, could you imagine if I was just Gary Vee? Like every morning I would do a morning show from like 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. just Q&A and would like take, you think I'm penetrating all the channels now? It'd be over. I would do it every day. It's my favorite thing to do. Tea with Gary Vee. You know like, (laughs) nice glass of tea, just put them on, call me, boom, 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 boom. Clip, 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 distribute, distribute. Every day. Look how pumped we get when we do, one of the reasons I did 4Ds was for the what did I just say? Because hiring is guessing. Firing is knowing. Like that thing's gonna kill on LinkedIn. That's two million in the bank. We start putting out song on VSPs every month and we now do a song a week on YouTube, which is a demo. We then went on tour in Europe and started daily vlogging, which was amazing. And the fans came and watched it. Like that's how it's gonna go. Like it's gonna be like a thing. No, I do not. Because I think the fragmentation of attention is different than 1984. <laughs> Madonna could do too much exposure because there's only 37 places and if she kept doing it, we would get bored. In today's world, there's so much, as big as I am or as big as a, I mean as big as like Drake is, like most, like it's so much fragmentation, right? Like you talk, you back to hip hop, you look at average 15 year old kids, what they like in hip hop, like nobody knows who they are because they're all SoundCloud rappers, right? So like, I think, no I do not. It, look, The music business is predicated on a singular hit that changes the course of your career. So why wouldn't you give yourself 365 chances a year for that singular hit? Right? It, it, I'm telling you, this is ideology of the past. Not This is everything for me right now in society and definitely in business. We have not yet, as a collective, completely understood what the internet is. I mean, I'm, not even, I'm just being very basic. Like, we, it's a young thing. We're, but just like the macro brother. Like everything we do is predicated on a world that was predicated on print and television and radio. But now the internet's number one, it is. And so every rule goes the other way because distribution is not limited. Distribution was limited in the old world. So everything was formed around that distribution. In this world, it's in perpetuity, unlimited. So it becomes a game of best, not first. they will never, you know? And so, yeah, I think you should put out as much content as possible. If you actually believe something in a meeting and it might be against the grain, saying it in a respectful way matters because in three years when it becomes true, the other seven people in that room will remember that and that may lead to the growth in your career that you're looking for. People think they grow in their career by staying within the framework of their organization. They're actually quietly, subconsciously ruining their career if they don't agree with the point of view. And I know for fact, because the best part of can for me, hands down, is two, three o'clock in the morning when people have so much rosé in them, they start talking truth. I know for, 
I know for a fact that there's a lot of people that have strategies or executions they don't personally believe in. It's just a framework of where the margin is in their company or what they have to be held accountable to a bonus. And that's a tough life uh, in, in some way. I mean, this is only just work. There's much bigger things going on. But I will say being on the record in a room respectfully of what you actually believe, brave, is a very, very good idea. And honestly, back to brave, there's so much content, there's so much going on in the world. What I think this room believes and defines as brave is actually the only prayer to break through consumer attention to make something happen in your business. Yeah, I was like the story, like you said that you wore that at your first WrestleMania, or like when you went the, as a kid. How about this? Show them, yeah, show them. Yeah. You saw it? Oh yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. How about this? Somebody found it. Oh, no. I, I haven't seen it yet because I didn't have the software. Before and after? I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. I like that. I went to WrestleMania for, yeah, it was WrestleMania. Oh, he made one, huh? What, with Tyson? Yeah, with Tyson. Yeah. The best part of that, I come down with a sign that says, I love the Jets. Oh, the sign. Get that out of there! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me establish this in WrestleMania. Well, I thought you were a kid. <laughs> That's amazing, holy <laughs> shit. I can't believe I did that. I'm crazy. Literally, it makes no sense. I have a need to hack WrestleManias and push Jets propaganda. That's basically my 20 year plan. Every 20 years I hack WrestleMania with Jets propaganda. You should create a Jets character to go into the WWE. I, I want to be, I, I'm probably going to be in WrestleMania. How many people, by show of hands, work in a job and are desperate for their side hustle to become their career. Just raise your hands. So many of you created golden handcuffs for yourself that aren't letting you leave your job because you need to make 130,000 a year now because you wanted 700 more square feet in your apartment or you wanted a BMW instead of a Toyota. I've realized that really kind of caught me off guard is how many people spend more money on sh than they can afford. The fact that 35% of this audience wants their side hustle to be their careers, but the reason they can't is because they can't quit their job because they need their job to pay for dumb sh to impress people they hate. And so you're not happy because you wanted two or three things that mean at Absolutely nothing. Why are you not willing to take one step backwards for a step for the rest of your life? Go do your thing. You're gonna die. It's going to end. Something bad is gonna happen. Something great is gonna happen. But most of all, nothing is gonna happen unless you do something. Please stop looking for permission. Please go do that thing you wanted to do. Ask that person out. Start that company. Quit that bullshit job. You can always get another bullshit. Job. People start businesses to take the money out to buy themselves things, which is why they never build long-term big businesses. You have to understand there's a fundamental reason I have the career that I have. The only thing I have is energy for the long term. When you can oversell your reality, but then build to the new reality, that's how you get big. For Vayner Media, I was able to over the last five years grow us from 22 people to 800 people, from 3 million to 100 million in revenue because I can continue to do my model. We're gonna make less money this year at 100 million than we made last year at 67. Net, I don't mean percentage, net. Historically, I've liked to run them where one year is profitable and the next year is not. So the growth is there, but the non-profitable other, every other year was predicated on me being able to invest in people, advertising, or resources. More people, more capabilities, because I'm gonna take the whole f-ing pie. 99% of the market is short term, and the 1% that isn't, and has the talent, wins every time. Which makes no sense, because unless you're gonna die, you should only play long term. If you're gonna live to be in 2020, you might as well play to be in 2020. Never ever be at the mercy of something else. That's why I'm the best at my craft. I don't even want to be at the mercy of my own employees. That's why I got my hands in absolutely everything. Mm-hmm. What if they quit? What if they get sick? What if they get bored? What if they win the lottery? That's literally how I think about everything. That's why I'm in everything. Yeah. I don't micromanage, but I'm dangerous enough in everything because I don't want a point of failure. Mm-hmm. Your point of failure is called Google. Yeah. They literally change your, no matter how evergreen and white hat you've been, mm-hmm. 
They just might decide that video content is part of their macro strategy. Competitor has videos apparently. So what, what I always think is when you got something working, always have a nest egg of 20% of your money and energy of building up other things that if God forbid your 80 goes to zero, you're on the course of being okay. People always say they're gonna do shit. The biggest epidemic in the world is people talking, not doing. And especially now, and people always do that. But now what social media does is expose people. It doesn't change people. All the hate in the system, that's exposing. Twitter didn't make you evil, you're evil, you know? And same with talking and not doing. Twitter, Instagram didn't make you waste time and not do. Don't like delete your app off your phone and think you're being productive now. That's the byproduct of what's going on here. You're just gonna watch TV instead. You're just gonna play Fortnite instead. You're just gonna go to coffee shops and make pretend you're working instead. People always talk. Today, with all the things that have happened to me, I get emails on Facebook from friends I went to high school with, often starting with, Gary, you're so lucky. I reply to every single one of them, all of them, with the reply of an opening line first, Jan, great to see you again. You look great, kid's super cute. P.S. I am super not lucky. Let me remind you, Rick, remember when we graduated college and you went to the Jersey Shore every weekend and hooked up with chicks and drank beer? I worked. You know, when I was 22 to 28, I was making 35 to $55,000 a year, but I had no expenses. I didn't go on vacations. I didn't buy fancy things, so I saved my money. I saved my money, I saved my money, and then when, the t- you know, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars. I didn't have millions. I had hundreds of thousands of dollars because I didn't spend anything, and, uh, and then I started making $100,000 a year and 150000 a year, and by the time I was 33, 34, when I had that opportunity, I still not bought a home. I was still in an apartment. I was 33 years old, and I was renting, and uh, because I was saving cash to go on the offense. And I knew something would happen one day and it did. And so when I had a chance to invest in those companies, I put hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions, but those hundreds made millions, made tens of millions. And so that's it, nothing crazy, nothing. I didn't have any crazy, crazy advantage. There's a lot of people that make $55,000 a year when they're 23. The problem is they go to Coachella and they wanna buy a watch and they wanna buy a BMW and I didn't. So I ate for 13 years and then I had a moment and I struck. I stood in front of this company in September and rolled out a new vision called the yeah. Vayner Volume Model. 98% of them thought I was out of my mind. Okay. <laughs> Didn't believe in it at all. That it thought that I'm like the crazy founder and like I'm silly, but like when it becomes real, this, you know, so just lead. Just... Anytime you have full buy-in from your employees, you're in a dangerous place. You make the video after it. <laughs> Why do you say that? So, let's see it, it means that there should be some sort of friction from somebody who's leading up in front and sees everything and is driving a company versus people that work in it who are in the, like, they're, they're, like my job is to be like, oh sh- there's an iceberg. Yeah. I'm gonna move this way. And everybody who's downstairs is like, what do you mean? The water's been super clear the whole time. I'm like, no, no, there's an iceberg. But, there's a but they're in the f- basement. Yeah. They're like, it's been such a nice, ride, like this has been so smooth. Leaders need to understand what's happening next. Employees are executing on the current and overvalue the past. Being best always plays out in the end, it just takes longer. True. You understand? Got it, yeah. yeah, I mean I think right now in this world where everyone's like such in a rush, right? Like just, you know, in a rush for success, like if you've really got those advantages and it's something that you've always been into before it was cool or what yeah. have you, you just play it out and you just run that marathon. For building my brand out, we're gonna have a second location that we're opening. For building my brand, best way of book going then is The same thing you're doing now. Yeah. Just stay the course. Stay the course. That was literally the video I posted yesterday on Instagram. I've been saying for the last six months a lot, randomly and shit like this. I don't understand how people understand that the thing that you did to get you there is the thing that gets you to the next level, but people think once you get to a level, now you gotta change it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's when you gotta double down on it. People change once they get some level of success. Like, notice my reactions. I'm like, whoa, you gotta spend more. Second location, same. It's very funny how humans work. Like, they find something that works, this is like in health and fitness, this is in business, and for some reason, there's this need to find something else when you've just shown yourself what works. Shiny to, 
Yeah, yeah, it's like, am I missing, there's this insecurity, am I missing something that could be better when something's clearly working? You know, I feel, I always use, I always think of, I don't know why this is the analogy, I always bring it up, it's like a fruit from a tree, it's like, I, here's a beautiful, huge orange tree in the back of your yard. You're pulling the orange and you're only squeezing like 30% of the juice out and you're like, this is delicious orange juice and you're like, should I grow an apple tree? I'm like, no, like squeeze more oranges. So you have under right, you don't 300, have a lot of, yeah. yeah. It's under 100, yeah. No, no, this is like my whole mantra of like garage selling and everything. Like for example, if this conversation was happening in October, mm-hmm. I would have been like, okay, please buy two Giannis rookies. Mm-hmm. They're 170 bucks, mm-hmm. they're gonna go up. They're 450 now. So, you take that, now you got a thousand, now you're sitting here today, and I'm like, okay, thousand. Uh, what would be like my number one thing to do at the thousand? Um, wait a second, a thousand. Probably Luca Don. I'd probably buy Lucas for fifty a piece, buy twenty of them, and sell them for seventy-five a piece in October when the season starts. Just it's just guaranteed. You might want to take a risk on Darnold. Baker's a hundred bucks base rookie. Darnold's forty. And like th- th- that just doesn't make any sense to me. And so if Darnold beats Baker on Monday Night Football in Week Two, I just think like the math can get to 80 real fast. And then if you have more money, the real thing to do is buy these basketball cards that are about to come out and try to pull, it's gambling. You can pull a $5,000 Zion rookie card. Because hmm. it's all one of one, one of 50, patches, autos, like all the, it's, it's really happening though. Like all these sneaker kids are getting into it. My generation's having, has children now of the age that can collect. That's what happened to me and a lot of other people. 40 of the first 50 speeches I gave were free. Hey man, I've been doing them. I've been doing them. And then the market will speak. Right. Put in the work. You know, it's, you know it's, like, it's like a band, it's like a comedian, it's like a rapper. You gotta do shows. Right. Gotta do shows. You gotta do raps. At I'm first, no, nobody knew who the fuck I was. Right. Nobody knew who E.T. was. Everybody knows now. Appreciate Just you, man. You got it, bro. Yeah, of course. Thank you so Thank much you for everything you do. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. God bless you. Thank you, bro. God bless you. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Damien Posey, Uncle Damien Speaks. I got Watch you. for me, man. I be coming. I'll do what you're telling me to do, man. <laughs> Keep doing Early it, bro. In the morning, trolling, I appreciate the Talking like, you know what I'm saying? Not trolling, but you know what Bringing I'm saying. value. Bringing value. Bringing value. God bless you. Thank you, bro. I don't have any secret arsenal of apps. You know, like, I use all the same shit everybody else does. Um, I just, it's what I fill the platforms with is what matters. Everybody's got the same, everybody starts with zero followers, and everybody's got the same apps that everybody's on. It's what you fill it with. The biggest difference between me and the far majority of the market is every time I put out a piece of content, I literally through my brain, in my soul, think, what's this gonna do for them? 99% of people when they post, think about what's this gonna do for me? That's the game. How many likes, how many likes am I gonna get? How many t-shirts am I gonna sell? Who's gonna see this that's gonna feel cool for me? Everything's about me, 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 which is why everything seems the same, which is why everything's sitting in a swan in a pool in the Hamptons. It's like, it's all the same shit. Flowers in the hair at Coachella, gold fake watches, jumping fences to take a photo at the private plane place. It's all the same shit. It's me, me, me. The second you don't think that way, the second everything changes. And growing up in restaurants and retail stores where you serve is an incredible framework. And I got lucky that I went through those experiences before this world came because it became my framework. One of the great reasons my company does well is there's not a single person that works at VaynerMedia that does the work more than I do. As the CEO of my company, there's not one employee that works for me that produces more content, deploys more ads. Like, I'm living in the trenches. I'm a practitioner. I'm in meetings sometimes with the platforms where I'm correcting their mistake of what their platform can do. What's the secret of, of making people engage with your content? I mean, it's, it's just empathy. smarts, empathy, okay. Empathy is the secret. I believe I sit at where I am in the lexicon, which is I think a winning player in today's new environment because I'm empathetic to my audience. I put out content that brings them value, not makes me feel good about myself. Literally, literally, the core thing that I keep pushing, because I believe in it the most, is patience. 
so many people can be successful. The problem is they're trying to get there so fast, they cheat and then they lose. Not super complicated. It's really not. It's like everybody's so like passionate of looking successful that it f***s them up from actually being successful. I'm kind of fantasizing of like moving to another country and starting from the beginning just because the beginning's my favorite part. It's the process. It's the process. And that's the, honestly, that's the same point of like, it's easy for me to be patient because I like playing more than I like the things that playing gives me. And everybody wants the stuff that playing gives them. When people are like, what have you done wrong? And I'm always like, I have, like I haven't really, I haven't, I don't, I'm too much of an immigrant and always have a nest egg and never put myself in a position to lose it all because I don't care enough about the money. Like, so I'm never gonna be like that guy, but the things I've done wrong are the things I haven't done. The things I've done wrong are the things I have not done. So missed opportunities. Missed opportunities that are hidden that I'll never know if, what the f- I don't know. What have I done wrong? I should have done that TV show. I should have gone on that yacht with that billionaire. I should have, like a million things I've done wrong. I mean, I should have said yes to Uber. To, I mean, the delta in my Uber is $500 million. That's a lot of money. I'm the only person I thanked in my book besides my family. Like, it's not like some random guy pitched me. It was my homie. Because I bought a house that I wasn't super liquid. And it was a side project. So all my biggest mistakes are the things I haven't done, not the things I've done. You know what was going on in Silicon Valley when Steve Jobs was at his height? Young dudes thought they had to be like Steve. Do you know how excited, Claude can tell you better, do you know what we're doing here? I'm inspiring a totally different alpha executive, female and male. That's huge. That's legacy. That's cool. Like, what? Like, you could be an alpha assassin winner and have a heart as your logo? What? That, you know, it may seem too, you might be too close to it, but it's super cool. It's super different. And it's, go, see ya. <laughs> Thank you. I listen to Marcus more than you. I love you guys, see ya. That, that's why I love, you know, listen, this is, you know, actions over words. I'm very much a good guy and want to like do a lot of nice things and I'm also want to buy the New York Jets. Like you can have, you, right. you can be, you know? And I think that's where people are getting caught. They feel like you either have to be an alpha businessman and kill everybody and ruthless and terrible or you need to be a hippie. And I'm like, why can't you do both? Like, why can't you succeed by being good and being a good person and being a, a, a good operator and successful? It's kind of like how I think about athletes. Athletes are allowed to be really tough on the field. Trip you and rug it back, you know? And then when the game's over, it has your family, share jerseys. But business people, that's how I think about it. When I'm making business decisions, I've got to, you know, I've got to win. The highest rate of suicide amongst kids, I'm talking 18 year olds and younger, my, my two cousins. Is that, a, is that a poverty issue? Is that a... It's a poverty issue, it's a self-esteem issue. Because they see, to me, it's like they see things on social media and their life doesn't mirror that because it's still dirt floors, walking outside to use the bathroom in the middle of South Dakota. But, but to your point, like the, the thing that really matters is like, look, no television didn't give them images either, right? Like, like the current state is your Instagram feed. It used to be MTV Cribs. It's all the same shit. It's either you're good with what you've got or you're not. It's either that you're, you've got FOMO of what somebody else has or not, you know? Which is why it needs to become an insular game. And so you have these kids that see this stuff. This is, you know, I apologize, but the, you've got me. The, the, thing that, you know, the thing that you said to me, and which means that we both understand, is our humble beginnings is our strength. Yes. We have to. My big thing with the internet is like, so when I came up, I'm 43, when I came up the business world, because I was such a shit student and I didn't come from the right pedigree and I didn't go to Harvard or I didn't go to McKinsey, I was considered to have no chance of success. Like flat out. Like that was just the rules of the game. These kids, the kids in dirt floors right now in South Dakota on an Indian reservation, the internet allows them to actually have a chance. It does, it does. And so my big thing is I now believe that the have nots yeah actually have a bigger advantage because they think the haves are entitled and soft and actually more macro insecure. Like the kid, the kid who's got the best passes to Coachella and a BMW and their parents bought their way into a great college, they're hurting inside more than people realize. 
because they actually lose no matter what. No matter what they achieve, they didn't achieve it. Their parents put them on. Us, though we suck, and we studio apartment, six family members, third floor, but if we achieve, it's us. And, and with this, oftentimes I reference Mariano Rivera when I talk about my career, Mo. Mo, mm-hmm. Mo was one of the great closers in baseball history. And at the Bobby end, knows that. At, Yankee and so you're gonna appreciate this. Right. He had one pitch. He was solid at everything else, but he had this one pitch, and besides Edgar Martinez, literally nobody could hit it. Uh, and that's who I think I am. I'm good at other things. I'm a good COO, like I can operate, that's why I have businesses. I'm very good at HR, I'm good at PR. Like I'm good at other things, but I am, uh, this is now me talking about myself, but if you ask me, I think I'm remarkable at understanding what humans are actually doing before the masses understand they're doing it, right? I understood that online dating in 2001 was gonna be mainstream. That wasn't obvious until 2011 right, or 13 or whenever Tinder really took hold, right? And so what I mean by that is I built Wine Library on the back of email and Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. In 1997, no liquor store in America thought it was a good idea to build up an email newsletter versus the catalog that they could send in the mail. Right. Got it? Right, yeah. In 2001, I bought every Google AdWord for every wine term Mm -hmm. and nobody was bidding me up. Rule number 29, be a marathon runner. I'm incapable of being a CEO of a publicly traded company, so no, we will not. Yeah, you, maybe Elon Musk should have said something like that at one point. <laughs> you know, right. I don't know Elon well enough and I know he's a character. I'm yeah. not I'm not incapable because I want to curse on video. I'm yeah. incapable because I don't know how to run a business that needs to perform financially every 90 days because I'm a marathon runner, not a sprinter. I don't want the cash infusion to buy a boat. I want to enjoy running a company and I need independence as an entrepreneur and so I'm not willing to give up my independence for $400 million up front. I'm just starting, I have my YouTube channel. I'm just having trouble like producing new content all the time. I would, doc- I would, I would highly recommend documenting versus creating. Okay. When you get into ruts, yeah. just do a day in the life or just something. But like when I do vlog type of content yeah. on my channel, my views are going a lot more down. Because then what? Uh, then like if I'm doing stuff on, because I have an audience of programmers. Yes. So when I'm doing stuff with coding content or something, those get a little bit more views. But but you're pandering to views instead of putting out content. That's true. If you're not inspired to do coding content, you're not going to put out anything that day. Right. I'd rather you... St- film yourself drinking a cup of coffee and maybe talking about the story of why you started coding in the first place. That's true, yeah, because you know what the problem, big problem I'm having is that I'm kind of, I don't feel like really coding that much anymore because I'm focusing on running the business. Yeah, and talk I'm, about that. I'm not really related to the pe- when I, audience. When anymore. I first started doing business videos instead of wine videos, my, my views collapsed because my audience was wine people. Yeah. But then I just built it back up. You can't live your life predicated on how many views the video is gonna get on YouTube, right? Okay, so I'm just trying to, okay, so yeah, that's, that's important for me to understand. It's the biggest important thing for co- content producers to understand. Everybody's getting caught up in likes and subscribers right. instead of actually living their life. Well, okay, so here's the thing. I also have, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm running a business as well, so I'm trying to get the, so it's not just likes and subscribers, I'm trying to cultivate a community of developers who are then also purchasing our products. Well then bring them, then you gotta bring them value. Right. Then every single thing that you should be putting out has nothing to do with likes or subscribers. Right. It should be like, what in the world is gonna help this developer? And you have to make that content with the expectation of them never buying your product. Right. Then you'll grow. Yeah, that's true. I know. You know how many people I've changed their lives and made them millions of dollars and still haven't bought a sneaker or bottle of wine for me? And it doesn't bother me one bit. Entrepreneurship is scary and you have to fight against the system and you have to see things others don't and you have to challenge norms. And I quit school in third grade. You know, like, I did. Like, it's super weird. But like, I started getting D's and F's in fourth grade. I consciously 
walked into fourth grade and said, I'm out. <laughs> I did. I did. And it was mainly because for who knows why, and I, I, st- I really have no answer for this, but I just remember, I mean, fourth grade, you're a, ch- I mean, you're a baby. It's a, it's a, it's, I'm looking at like other, four, like, <laughs> it's crazy to me that I actually had the thought process of, this isn't for me, I know who I am, I'm gonna be this, and I don't care about the periodic table. You don't wanna go to college? You don't have to go to college. You don't wanna be a doctor? You don't have to go be a doctor, right? But that also means that if that's what your parents want and that's what they're willing to pay for, you can't be like, hey mom, you know how you're gonna give me 80,000 to go be a doctor? That, that's what you, you want? Well, I don't want that. I wanna be a painter, so give me that 80,000. That's not how it that works. works yeah. You have to leave that on the table. That money, that infrastructure comes with that ambition. Like, if you want that safety and that money, well, that means you're gonna be a lawyer. If you wanna be a motorcycle racer, that means you're gonna live in a studio apartment with 19 friends. People ask the dumbest shit. This kid the other day is like, Gary Vee, but how do you do this in the Bay Area? It's so expensive. I'm like, you moved, You don't live in the Bay Area. You have a choice. People are like, Gary, uh, you, they, they, what the f***? Like, you're trying to pay $14 an hour? How do you survive in New York City? I'm like, you live in Queens and you take, like, like you can do anything. Mm-hmm. You have options. People aren't willing to sacrifice for what they want. I do not care about money. I love the f- game. Like, people buy dumb sh- Like, I, lately people been coming at me a little bit. It happened this week and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You keep telling all of us that you didn't make any money, but how'd you have money to invest in Facebook, Uber, and Twitter? Just like a thing that's popped up this last week. And I'm laughing, because I'm replying, I'm like, because I lived in an $1,100 a month apartment that was a piece of shit. In Jersey, I went on no vacations, I bought no $4 coffee, I didn't buy any swag clothes, and I saved. I made 41,000 a year, the first three years of my career, and I saved 9,000 each of those years. You know how many in here make 70K a year and lose money each year? Cause they got a credit I didn't have a credit card until I was 27. Nice. I had a debit card cause I wasn't gonna spend money I didn't have. I don't give a about money, I care about the game. So when I lose money, I don't care cause I just don't care about it. I think people value money too much. Cause they think, cause they think it buys them happiness. Like it, people think that, people think that. And I really don't believe it. I really don't. I don't think you get the same returns by overwhelmingly working on your weaknesses as you do on tripling down on your strengths. I don't know what else to say. Like, it's, it's so clear to me. I think so much of what I talk about is predicated on not only my successes, but watching my family members, watching that whole ecosystem of startup founders, uh, just watching. I watch a lot, I read a lot of like, people's behavior more so than, you know, books or things of that nature. And so, yeah, I mean, I just, I I believe that the entrepreneurs that have gone on to quadruple down on their strengths and then hire around their weaknesses have had much better success than the ones that dwell on their shortcomings because somebody they look up to was good at it and said it was important and they waste their time on something they'll never be. I'm unbelievably in tune with the fact that it's almost impossible to become a human being and I have no interest in taking that for granted. Like, like if, if, I love when analytical people, like I, so when I have a very deeply math kid in front of me and we're having some sort of debate and they're upset about something, I'm like, you do know the odds of being a human being are 400 trillion to one, right? Like, I, I think that what drives me is an unbelievably clear perspective to how lucky we are to have an at bat and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to dwell on dumb shit. As long as eight people that I love more than life are alive that morning, I'm in good spirits. I really am. Yeah, you know, like, I, look, I think, I think adversity and humble beginnings is an incredibly good framework to happiness if you layer positivity and optimism around your difficulty. Um, a lot of times people look at their difficulty and dwell and go the other way. Uh, so for me, 
what, what? It's t- like I'm excited every day because I get to play. People who are, are, are dragging down the culture of a business should be, they shouldn't be there. It's I wish most businesses were into documenting and coach. What <laughs> most businesses are doing is, Harold's a d- but his numbers are remarkable. Yeah. That's what's really happening. That's what I'm referring to. That if you've got somebody who's driving top line revenue or is she or he is crushing their numbers, what most companies are doing is they're looking at surface level. They're like, ooh, if we fire Carol, we're gonna lose those three accounts because she's so wired in there. What they don't realize is the hidden lost revenue that's happening with Carol or Harold destroying the culture and completely messing up the continuity and speed of the macro. So what do you do, from your point of view, what do you do if you have, if you, you have someone who's really kicking ass, bringing the numbers in, and they're just a, they're, they're a jerk? What do you do with them? What I do, one, one man's point of view, is I sit them down, I look them dead in the face, and I say, you think I'm joking because you're delivering, but I'm not joking, and if you can't be a good human being, I'm going to fire your face. I grew up really lucky in the fact that I had disproportionate adversity in the first decade of my life. You know, I was born in Belarus. We came to the US when I was three. I lived in a studio apartment with eight family members. Um, You know, it was super immigrant, right? We didn't speak English. Like, you know, my, my, my dad, I didn't even know my dad until I was 14 years old and started working in his liquor store because he woke up to go to work before I woke up and he got home after I fell asleep. I went on one family vacation in my entire life you know, or two, excuse me, two in my entire high school life, both to Disney World in Orlando, you know, stayed in the Holiday Inn. Like, we kept it humble. We didn't buy dumb shit. You know, like, you know, I basically wore liquor t-shirts my whole life through high school because they were free <laughs> from the liquor store. Like, the level of humility and a lot of my ability to not worry about others was predicated on circumstance. Like, you know, and I, I, I really think that I'm the beneficiary of very good parenting and very lucky circumstances. And those lucky circumstances in my mind was I was never handed anything ever, ever. If there's one thing you want to tell every creative out there that's struggling now, that's trying to like get up to their career, what, what would that one thing be? It takes years of great creative work to get to that place. Like, stop judging yourself. Mm, Just because this one video didn't get as many views or not as many likes, Mm. don't judge yourself in the daily. Mm. Judge yourself in the yearly. And slow it down. Be patient. I love losing. Like, micro losing especially, Mm. more than macro losing, is incredibly motivating. You know, I mean, there's nothing more fun than losing regular season games. Right. You know, you learn from them. You <laughs> yeah. know, come the playoffs, you'd like to build on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think adversity is the foundation of success. My losses are my losses, right. and my wins are my wins, and they both feel the same. When I hear the accolades, or when I get razzed, I basically can't hear them. I'm just so in love with the process. And that's, and that's what getting up off the floor is. You had no choice, you just, it's in your DNA to want to play. The most important thing I think about when I think about getting to happiness is not so much owning anything, it's the ability to not hear anything but yourself. There's nothing more powerful than when everything gets quiet and the only thing that penetrates is your own voice and that voice isn't judging you. I will never fail because there is no failure. The at bat is the macro win. If I lost all my money because I did 37 ridiculously bad decisions and over leveraged myself, the ability to go back to zero and try to like buy shit at the dollar store and flip it on eBay and build it back up weirdly excites me more than where I am right now. I swear on my children's health. No kidding. The thought of going to zero, having all of you judge me as, see, he wasn't as good as you thought, and then rising back like a phoenix and sticking it in your face (laughs) excites the shit out of me. I, I believe that right there is the definition of entrepreneurship. It's when you love your game more than what the game gives you. That's why I like losing. The game told me I lost. Respect to the game. You're 10 years old, 
confidence is a very funny thing. You're still forming as a human, but the reality is, is if you're twitching and you're over responding to how many subscribers you have or what your friends in school are saying, you're not going to be able to be successful. And so you're lucky, Giovanni, to be able to start this process now, not when you're 45 years old. The quicker you get comfortable with judgment of others, the more likely you'll be successful long term. The way to get your confidence up is to start enjoying the pushback, is to start enjoying people say that you can't, is to start enjoying the judgment of others who don't understand. If you're not comfortable in your own framework, you'll never succeed. I think the thing that I'm conscious of is off the screen, I'm real happy too, right? Like, you know, I think something, one thing that's really been interesting is as, as awareness around an individual grows, a level of responsibility comes along with it. I'm definitely at a point right now where I'm really am being thoughtful of like, look, there's a lot of eyes on me and a lot of people who are not happy are putting their eyes on me and I'm helping them through that and I I need to be hyper sensitive in my own self of articulating things that I'm unhappy about Mm -hmm. and but what's been really interesting is I've been really on this kick for six or nine months. I'm struggling to be unhappy because I've come to realize it's unbelievable how simple my life is. If I genuinely wake up in the morning and eight to 10 people are actually still alive, um, I'm just struggling to be upset about stuff. I'm, I don't yeah. know what else to say. I struggle with, my perspective on life is very simple, which is it's such a blessing. It's so rare, you know. Um, last time we were here, I made a, a, a video with you guys and in there, I talked about the 400 trillion to one and in that micro piece of content, which I've chopped up and used, it's one of my most successful pieces of content ever, happened in this building yeah. a couple of years ago. And I, I've really, inter- I've always internalized it. I finally articulated it a couple of years ago and I continue to internalize it, which is I am happy because I'd like to understand, I'd like somebody to sell me on what to be upset about. I'm not sure anybody is taking enough risk from 20 to 30. Yeah. It is the most interesting thing that I've been thinking about, which is it is never more practical to be disproportionately risky than from 22 to 30, yet everybody goes the other way because now they're the real world and it's time to prove something to their parents, to themselves, to everybody else, and everybody goes conservative. It is a huge mistake. We need to flip it upside down. Everybody should go ham from 22 to 30 and do a ton of ridiculous and figure themselves out. But, but, on your own dime, not your parents. <laughs> There's the parents clapping. So, so, how I think about it is, you should go and be rogue and get to know yourself and taste from 22 to 30, but you have to live by the ramifications of doing that. And the cost of entry of that is living with four people in a studio apartment, eating dog food, and not having fancy When you go and do that, but you're being subsidized by your parents, then you're living in a fake environment and you're super <laughs> Really into a new era of opportunity. You know, to me, the white space that technology continues to create and always will is really a thing that most businesses and people struggle with because the reality is, is that most people think about things based on what has already happened instead of being able to understand what's about to happen which is ironic because what's about to happen is already happened in history many times over. It's just you have to understand the pattern recognition and deploy it against the current state. And so for me, if you understood that jargon, for me, what is really interesting is that no matter who you are in this room today, the one thing I know we can talk about is attention of the person you're trying to reach. My entire career, I've come to realize, has been pretty simple. I've been chasing the attention of who I'm trying to reach, and that has worked for me since I was six years old. You know, probably my favorite entrepreneurial story for me about me to myself, like in my own head, is when I started my lemonade stand business, I commenced manipulated my friends to work the you know lemonade stands themselves I kind of 
scoured the streets of Edison, New Jersey, and if you think about how sick or interesting what I'm about to say is, it was interesting to me, it was fun for me to stand on the grassy knoll or on the corner and spend hours watching cars drive by to try to figure out which tree or which pole was the best one for me to put my lemonade sign on to sell more lemonade. That was intriguing to me. That was exciting for me. And 37 years later, I stand here in front of you in the same place, which is where is the attention of who I'm trying to reach? I've now lived you know, two hardcore careers that really map this room. The first 15 years of my career was hardcore consumer, right? Brick and mortar store, internet business at scale. You know, I, I built Wine Library on the back of email marketing. How many people here have done or do email marketing in their careers? Just raise your hands. Just hi, please. This is just gonna be fun for me to say. Like, in 1996, I had a 300,000 person email newsletter that had 93% open rates. And I built my dad's business from a three to a $60 million business in a seven year period with no cash infusion, no VC, not even a credit line. And it was because I made every penny work like a dollar. And in 1996, that was actually having a website when everybody else was sending catalogs in the mail. That was having an email newsletter which you know, for the kids in the room, like, you have to understand, like, people thought the whole internet was a fad, let alone email marketing, right? And then later, the one that really scaled me, which was the day Google AdWords started, I bought ads at five cents a click and owned every wine term in the world. <laughs> and, and it's really interesting, what, where I'm, at some point I'm gonna mention this, I would argue that one of the things that drives me tremendously is the great miss of my career during the great success of my career. I was so right about Google AdWords, but I'd never been through a pattern of buying very underpriced attention at scale that I didn't spend enough money on Google AdWords. Like when I, you know, some of you, and I know some of you that I know well, like when you hear three to 60, I'm very proud of that, but genuinely, I know I left 100 million in revenue on the table because I did too much direct mail, radio, television, outdoor, a mix of media. When I, you know, it's funny to say this in Vegas, I don't play poker, but there's something that's very easy to understand. When you have the best hand and you know it, you go all in. I knew I had the best hand with AdWords I, I, just, I just didn't, like, let me rephrase. In hindsight, I had the best hand. I knew it was great, I just didn't know how great it was. And so you can imagine when consumer, mobile, social, internet came along, the pattern recognition that I learned about email, which then became about Google AdWords, then I started the first, law, legitimately one of the first 10 long form YouTube shows in the first months of YouTube, which was a 20 minute show of me tasting wine. Um, yeah, best gig I ever had in my career. <laughs> I sat in front of a camera for 25 minutes, drank four bottles of wine, and it completely changed the course of my career. Like, I think, I think that's right, but I think, I think right now we're in a very convenient state and everybody's throwing around judgment and blame like it's free. And we need to, I, I feel a huge sense of responsibility to articulate accountability lack of entitlement and positivity because I believe in it. Yeah. And I understand, by the way, there's a, you know, it's funny, there's a very interesting thing going on here right now, which is there's an extraordinary amount of people that are content or happy, they just don't communicate, right? Like negativity by nature is louder, has always been. Your grandmother who's miserable was louder than your grandfather who's content. The problem is now words are being documented at scale. This has always been the way. There's nothing different right now. It's just that we can't look at our grandmother's tweets. F- if we could. <laughs> I mean, my grandmother was one of the most super negative people I've ever come across in my life. In my life. Just unbelievably negative. Everything was negative. Every good thing that happened was a conspiracy theory. And, and I used to be mad at her, and then I had to remind myself as I got older and more thoughtful, I'm like, this is a woman who lived in the Soviet Union, who went through World War II, and, you know, who saw some shit. 
and who lost her husband and who had a, because I knew my great grandmother too, had a negative, negative mother. And like, you become more empathetic as you become more thoughtful, but it doesn't take away from the fact that my grandma would have been spitting venom on Instagram if that (laughs) shit was around in 1957. You know, and so, (laughs) like, I think we need to get into some real conversations. And right now, the conversations are lazy. Social media is bad. It's Apple's job to restrict it. And that's cool. I'm like fine with a, a level of like platform and government involvement. I'm fine with that. But like you'll always be disappointed if you think some big force is gonna save you. Yeah. You'll always be disappointed. So just solve it for yourself. Let me tell you something about the market. The market is incredibly talented. You are over analyzing their inability to not know the truth. You mean the market? The, the net market. People leave comments on my shit all the time and always did too. People spend their whole life because they're hurting. People love to tear down things out of their own pain. You have a human or two or five or whoever this group is, yeah. most likely a very small group of one or two people, yeah who are so hurt. It's their life mission. <laughs> but you, I'm gonna try to help you. They have no say. Any person that believes their anonymous lies is not a piece of business that you want anyway. Got it? There are plenty of people who believe certain things about me, and that's lovely, because there's 7.7 billion people, and even if I keep crushing it in perpetuity, squeezing the f*** out of it, I will never get to even a fraction of it. Whatever you're losing from those pieces of have zero impact on your upside. You just don't see it that way yet. If every, listen to me, if every single person in this room believed it, it's a drop in the bucket in the market. By the way, the second you stop giving it love and attention, the second it stops getting interesting for them. You're giving them the leverage. When you realize you have 99.9999999999999999% of the world to focus on, they will get real quiet after you stop giving a Tell you what's really emerged. Entitlement. I was parented in a really, and my circumstances put me in a place where I just don't think anybody owes me anything. Not society, not, not the government, not people I do nice things for, that's a killer. Yeah. People struggle so much when they do something nice for somebody, they think that person owes them something. I'm, I'm desperately trying to give more value to every person I ever cross paths with and never ask for anything in return. That is literally the framework of my life. My great hope is that I can bring more value to people than they bring to me, and I'm never in a dire situation where I ever have to ask for anything in return. Tell us about failure and why it's important to I fail. I love it. Yeah, because you, you've, you've mentioned I love that you it. love it. I love it. I like micro failure. I like micro failure. I hate macro failure. Like, death of your business is bad. But, but, to me, you know what's funny? I'll use a boxing analogy. My favorite boxing, I watch a lot of boxing. I think boxing's a very interesting, and, I know, and I'm super into mixed martial arts, but I grew up on boxing, I understand it better. And I like watching it, because there's so many things that happen in boxing. First of all, what I love about boxing is there's nowhere to hide. You know, like it's super interesting, right? There's nowhere to hide. Number two, there's, some, there's a scenario in boxing that I love the most. There's, for some reason, there's nothing more interesting to me than watching somebody get knocked down in the first round and then go on to win the fight easily. It's an interesting psyche, right? And I like that, and this is what I'm thinking about it, which is like, here's what's bad in boxing and in business. Going into a fight, getting knocked the fuck out in the first round and losing the match, bad. Getting knocked down and then having the adversity to readjust to what you got caught on and navigating it to easily win a fight is remarkable. That's how I think about entrepreneurship. People, the reason so many people struggle with entrepreneurship is you have micro failures almost daily and they're very in your face. You can't hide. And uh, I like that. Uh, I like failure I, I, because I think I deserve it. I hate when people don't respect the game. When I fail, 
it means I fucked up. And I like that because I think people get audacious. My number one thing that I hate about capitalism is that people use it and they love it and they're big capitalists and they love open market and competition and all that and then they become 73 and they try to use all their money to protect their money. They're not willing to let a young lion eat them the way they ate somebody else. I hate when they try to manipulate it. That's what I love about sports. What I love about sports is when you're 36 and you were once the best player in the league, but now you're getting a little bit older and your body breaks down, you are forced to retire. The one thing that entrepreneurship and capitalism has to adjust to is once you get old and you're tired and you wanna be on a yacht instead of working your shit, you should lose some money because you're losing. How many people are asking me like, how, how do I live my dream, Gary? And you know, I don't have time. I have mortgages and bills and responsibilities in my job. I don't have time for my side hustle, my Twitch channel, my Instagram account, my Shopify store selling hoodies. And I keep getting to this new place, which is talk to me about your bills. Like, why'd you buy an apartment that stretches you? Why is your car so fancy? Like, why do you need the new Gucci every time? Like, why are you, why are you going out Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night? Like, why are you going to Coachella? Like, why, why are you going to Avengers opening night and buying the biggest piece of popcorn and candy? Like, the answer to all of your questions is not how much money you make or how much time you have, it's what you're spending your money on. Why do you want the newest pair of Yeezys? Why, why? entitled to your dream, you're not entitled. Nobody's entitled to be a, an amazing dancer. Nobody that, that tours the world and gets to dance and open for Beyonce and make 580 a year and live it and go to you know, Monaco on the weekends. Like, it's not how it works. Everybody starts at zero. Some people start at different places, but anybody who does it for themselves has to sacrifice. Like, yes, like, move. Like, my city's expensive, move. Like, my car payments are high. Sell your car and buy a piece of car, take the bus. This is dreams we're talking about. We're talking about dreams. We're talking about like, I wanna be a professional gamer. We're talking about, I wanna get paid $200,000 to give a speech. We're talking about that isn't normal. Dreams require sacrifices. People don't want to sacrifice. Like for some reason, DNA, parenting, circumstance, I'm on the extreme end of everything's my fault. Nobody owes me shit. I shouldn't get anything unless I bleed for it. It's one big framework, D-Rock, of like, of self-esteem, lack of self-esteem, slash insecurity, entitlement, or accountability, it's these huge things. I'm not judging people other than I'm asking people and I'm bringing up a different debate that isn't being talked about a lot, which is why do you want to go to Coachella? That's what I'm interested in. I do not think anybody who goes to college and studies entrepreneurship can beat me in entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean it's right. It, and it's just kind of how my brain works. Like, I feel like it's a crap. Like, I, I, I don't think like, I, I think of it as a, we have not defied entrepreneurship properly, here's why. Again, I absolutely believe people that go to school for entrepreneurship can get better at entrepreneurship from that process. I desperately believe that entrepreneurship is a talent similar to see, singing and playing sports and I think that I'm on that spectrum and that gives me confidence in this one little narrow thing of entrepreneurship because while everybody else was studying in school and like playing sports and doing whatever they were interested in, I was constantly entrepreneuring, right? And so I just have so much natural ability and so many years of practice that I feel like I'm on the extreme and that's why I'm confident about it. Evan, thank you so much for having a couple seconds 
and being able to tell the Believe Nation a little bit about Empathy Wines, it means a lot to me that you would take this valuable real estate and, and time on your channel to give me some love. It means a lot. It's just good karma points and so you're just, you're awesome. Thank you. Believe Nation, uh, if you're into wine at all, go to empathywines.com. My whole career's work was poured into producing a wine that rivaled 40 to $60 wine for 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, I'm just super excited about this subscription-based wine business. You can order three, six, or 12 bottles in subscription form, rosé, white, red. Um, if, you, if you search on Instagram or, or Twitter, you will be blown away. People are literally like, I don't even like Gary Vee, but the wine's good. Super proud of the effort. Thanks, Evan, for the time. Uh, wishing you guys all happy and healthy.